Welcome to Education Beat. I'm Ann Vasquez, CEO of EdSource. The University of California is considering a proposal this week to allow hiring undocumented students for jobs at its 10 campuses. The proposal is based on a legal theory that the federal ban preventing the hiring of immigrants without legal papers does not apply to states. The proposed change at UC would allow all students to have the same access to research positions and other campus jobs. One thing that I really would have wanted to do would have been peer counseling, right? I really enjoy mentoring. I really enjoy talking to young students of color, but I, I don't even apply because I know I'm not eligible. Critics say it would encourage unauthorized immigration. How have undocumented students been impacted? And what is motivating this UC proposal? Here is this week's Education Beat with host Zadie Stavely. Jeffrey Umaña Munoz was born in El Salvador and came to the U.S. with his parents when he was not yet two years old. I don't remember much of anything, you know. Most of my memories really are, um, I guess, made in America, (laughs) you know. At first, in elementary and middle school, Jeffrey didn't feel that different from his friends. But in high school, the reality of being undocumented became starkly clear. I think the very first time that it sort of hit me in the face was um, in my English class my junior year when I walked in and instead of, you know, being able to work on the on the daily vocab that we usually worked on, it suddenly became um, a pre-registration for voting. And it, it was almost ironic because at that point in time, I had developed myself as sort of the, the lead political student on campus, the one student you would talk to about political issues. And he was the one political tool that, you know, seemed like the most sacred, you know, it is the most sacred, the act of voting. And I couldn't access it. When his friends started looking at colleges, Jeffrey wasn't sure what he could afford. But California has passed laws to help undocumented students. Undocumented students here are eligible for in-state tuition, for example. And the UC system has professed support for undocumented students. It's one reason Jeffrey chose to go to UCLA. I thought there were more opportunities for me here. And that meant everything from just feeling like I would have an institution that understood the nuances of what an undocumented student experience was, so that it offered resources, anything from financial aid to scholarship support to counseling support, or anything in between, all the way to a a campus institution that has allowed for undocumented student programming to flourish. Jeffrey's now in his third year at UCLA. But he says he's been shut out of some opportunities his peers have because he's undocumented and he doesn't have a work permit. One thing that I really would have wanted to do would have been peer counseling, right? I really enjoy mentoring. I really enjoy talking to, especially to young students of color, being able to encourage them and empower them to be able to pursue higher education um, and, and be able to pursue these, the, the, these programs so that they can empower their communities as well. You know, but I, I don't even apply because I know I'm not eligible. Other undocumented students want to be resident assistants because that's a really pivotal job for college students, and they also can't do that. Jeffrey also had to turn down a job he was offered at the UCLA Labor Center to conduct research on immigrant communities and edit a book about undocumented immigrant youth. Instead, he does that volunteer. He found out he can't even serve in student government. Earlier this fall quarter, I was serving on a position within student government that the university classifies as campus-based employment. You know, I was like formally pushed out of a position because the university would not pay me, would not afford me the stipend that came with that student government role because I was undocumented. Because he can't have a work-study job on campus like many other students, Jeffrey makes ends meet in other ways. He's made and sold candles. He's sold food with his mom. On weekends, he collects cans and bottles with his parents to recycle, just to pay for food on campus. I was offered an equitable education at the same rate, at the same opportunities as everybody else, as every international student, as every student with permanent residency, as every student with natural born citizenship, and everybody in between. I was promised that same access. I'm not getting that. I'm being offered a second rate UC education, which fair, 
might be still incredible, but at this point, I am also seeing a very clear disparity between the education and the professional opportunities that are being offered to my peers with legal status and those that are being offered to me. Why am I being forced as an undocumented student to have to settle for an education while paying the same amount of tuition, while doing the same amount of homework, while doing the same amount of commitments and pouring myself into this university system while other students get back more? You know, the university prides itself on its values of equity, on its on its values of, of, of being able to afford equal opportunity to everybody, you know? It needs to be able to deliver on that. This is Education Beat, getting to the heart of California schools. I'm Zadie Stavely. This week, undocumented students ask UC to let them work. Jeffrey is one of the leaders of a student coalition calling on the University of California to authorize undocumented students to work across the university system. It's a proposal that is backed by more than two dozen legal scholars nationwide, and UC Regents are considering the proposal this week. My colleague Michael Burke wrote about this for EdSource. Hi, Michael. Hi, Zadie. So, Michael, explain to me what this group of students, faculty, and legal scholars are asking UC to do. They're basically asking UC to kind of adopt a new interpretation of a federal statute. The uh, UCLA Center for Immigration Law and Policy, they developed this legal theory. So there's a federal statute that I believe was signed by uh, President Reagan in 1986. That basically that was the beginning of sort of like this I-9 system is how one of the scholars described it to me. Basically, you know, banning the hiring of undocumented immigrants who, you know, obviously don't have uh, legal status, don't have, you know, a green card or, or anything like that. So the legal theory is basically that states in general ha- have the right to determine um, the employment qualifications of state employees. And this statute, particularly, there was also a 1996 amendment that specifically um, only cited that it applied to federal uh, entities. And so the legal theory is that you know, since states aren't mentioned and states historically have the power to determine the qualifications of their state employees, then thus states wouldn't be binded by this statute. And so from there, the argument is also that UC is a state entity. And so therefore UC employees are state employees and UC would have the power to determine the qualifications of their own employees and this federal statute wouldn't apply to them. Okay. And so I understand that at least 26 legal scholars signed on to that theory. But there are conservative immigration experts that, of course, question the argument. That's right. Yeah. So there's certainly another side to this. Conservative critics have said that hiring undocumented students would encourage more people to immigrate without authorization. The New York Times quoted Laura Reese, the director of the Border Security and Immigration Team at the Heritage Foundation and a former acting deputy chief of staff at the Homeland Security Department, as saying, quote, under the law, it is illegal to hire unauthorized aliens and for good reason. Work opportunity is the number one pull factor of illegal immigration, end quote. It's not really clear how UC sees this, whether they agree with, you know, the legal theory that was developed. It was actually at UCLA's Center for uh, immigration law and, and policy. UC's own office of the general counsel, they haven't taken a stance publicly yet. So not clear yet if UC's, you know, board of regents or their general counsel agrees with that, but we should get a better idea later this week uh, at the regents meeting. Can you explain to us a little bit more about what kind of jobs these students would, would end up working at? Yeah, so it could be a whole lot of things. I think the biggest thing that came across when I did my reporting was you know, students, undocumented students in particular, obviously are really missing out on the chance to get jobs that are critical to sort of their learning and and career experiences. So like research positions across the campuses or internships that are at UC. So those are big, but also, you know, it could also just be sort of the, you know, like working at the dining hall or at the student center, just jobs to kind of, you know, work study to help you pay for college. So I think there are kind of, you know, a whole lot of positions and and employment opportunities that it would open up for students. When Michael's article published, someone commented that DACA was supposed to help with this, 
Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, offers temporary protection from deportation and permission to work for people who came to the U.S. as children. The program began in 2012, and it protects about 650,000 people. But tens of thousands of people who are eligible for the program have not been able to get it. Here's the thing. To apply for DACA, you have to have been in the U.S. since 2007. You have to have come before you turn 16, and you can't apply until you turn 15. For lots of current high school and college students, they were too young to apply before the Trump administration stopped accepting new applications in 2017. Jeffrey Umaña Munoz turned 15 that year. Which is the exact same year that Trump rescinds the program. And immediately upon that rescission, court orders um, state that, you know, no, no new applications, right? And so for those, what was it, three years up until 2020, I wasn't able to apply until that brief window in the winter of 2020 when a court order briefly allowed new applications in. So in 2020, Jeffrey did apply for DACA. But within a few months, almost three months later, it was frozen again by the Fifth, by the fifth Circuit. My uh, application is frozen in court because of back and forth litigation that sort of has rendered me to this um, this state of in betweenness every other every other few months when a new decision comes out. Michael, can you tell us what other students told you about um, what what they think about this proposal? Yeah, so I talked to a student. Her name was Melissa Palacios from UCLA. She's born in Mexico, um, grew up in in LA or spent some time in LA before she went to college. And yeah, she was, you know, really hopeful that um, not only UC would adopt this policy, but that, you know, if they did, it would set a precedent and maybe the Los Angeles Unified School District or other school districts would follow because she's actually uh, getting her master's in education. She has a teaching credential. She wants to be a high school history teacher. But obviously right now there, there's no option for her to become a teacher uh, either at, you know, UC has schools that she could potentially uh, teach at the UCLA lab school, for example. So this would be a big deal to her to, you know, she, she told me that all she wants to do is teach. So, yeah, this would be necessary for that. She even mentioned to me that during I think it was this past year, she was offered a, a research position uh, with a professor who's studying bilingualism and she's she has a bilingual authorization. So that was something she was really interested in, but she couldn't do uh, again because of her, her, you know, being undocumented. So I think for students like her, it, w- it would really make a, a major difference. Um, and going back to what I said earlier, even even just being able to afford college, uh, she, she mentioned that she would have you know loved to be able to take part time jobs at UCLA's dining halls or, or their student centers to, to help pay for college because obviously going to UCLA, going to th- these different UCs that are in really high cost of living areas, San Diego, Berkeley, you know, Santa Barbara, there it's it's not cheap. So even just that part of it would be, I think, really helpful to you know students like her. So Michael, you mentioned the Regents meeting this week. When will that happen? Yeah, the meeting actually starts Tuesday, but based on the agenda, they're going to take up this item on Thursday. I talked to the faculty person from the UCLA Center that had, you know, developed the legal theory. And he had told me that they've had meetings with UC's general counsel and they didn't, you know, really disagree with their theory. He said basically no one has like come out and disagreed with the theory. But in the case of the general counsel, they did express some, you know, wariness um, and which he said he wasn't necessarily surprised by because, you know, for the past 35 or 40 years, this federal statute has been on the books and pretty much everyone has assumed that it did apply to states and state governments. So I don't think that really was surprising, but definitely something to watch um, as UC, you know, comes closer to taking this on publicly. So I would expect that if the UC does approve this policy to allow the hiring of undocumented students, it could be challenged in court. Yes, that definitely seems like a real possibility. Critics of the proposal say it's likely to lead to legal challenges and might have an uncertain future if a Republican president takes office. As the designated student representative of the coalition, Jeffrey has met with many UC regents about the proposal. He says he heard a lot of support for undocumented students, but also some hesitancy. But from Jeffrey's perspective, the proposal has strong legal grounds. And he says the possibility of a legal challenge doesn't justify not trying. 
You know, undocumented students have had to live in fear all of our lives. You know, we're continuously living in fear. We're continuously being subjected to the, to the shadows. Why is it that currently there's so much rise in anti-immigrant, not just rhetoric, but policy? Why can they push the boundaries so far on what we deem acceptable, but we can't push the boundaries and, and deem what's acceptable for supporting our communities? We don't need another lawsuit to tell us what we have already found in our research, and it's that the UC has the power to do this. They should do it, and even if that means being courageous and taking a step forward and doing it and being the leading institution and doing it, they should because that is what they pride themselves in. And if what and what they most pride themselves in is the support and the protection that they give their undocumented students. And we're asking them to, 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 to deliver on that finally in a way that is creative, that is ingenious, you know, and that actually pushes the buck forward. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Education Beat, getting to the heart of California schools, a production of EdSource. You can find Michael's story at edsource.org. Our producer is Kobe McDonald. Special thanks to our guests, Jeffrey Umania Munoz and Michael Burke. Our CEO is Ann Vasquez. Our theme music is from Blue Dot Sessions. This episode was brought to you by the ECMC Foundation and the Lumina Foundation. I'm Zadie Stavely. Join us next week and subscribe so you won't miss an episode.